This synthesis from 1988 by Raymond Funk and co-workers uh, uses some interesting sulfury agents and is also just generally quite a, an interesting route, so I thought I'd make a video on it. Uh, you can see this natural product is quite devoid of any functionality unless you count the double bond, so it's an interesting exercise in how to assemble a hydrocarbon skeleton in the right way. So the first step in the synthesis is the addition of this 4-carbon Grignard reagent into the enol ether of cyclohexane 1,3-dione. Uh, and there's one mistake you can make here. Uh, this reaction looks like it might be a conjugate addition and then loss of ethoxide, and if that is your assumption, uh, you should think a little bit more carefully about the mechanism by which we get to this intermediate here. Uh, but anyway, once we have obtained this functionalized uh, cyclohexenone ring with the side chain appended, uh, the next step is the addition of a uh, cuprate reagent. Uh, we know these copper lithium species prefer to add in a conjugate sense, so the uh, effectively methyl minus adds at this position uh, and in sets up the quaternary center here. And then the next step is the first really interesting reaction in the synthesis, and they make use of this very interesting reagent here, a trimethylsilylated uh, thioketal. Uh, we know that sulfur and silicon can stabilize alpha anions, and so this can be deprotonated with a strong base like butyl lithium, uh, and then this carb anion can add into carbonyls like this. And then the rest of the reaction pathway is essentially the same as the Peterson olefination, so depending on who you ask, the next step is either concerted or stepwise, but the oxygen uh, negative charge can attack at the silicon here, and then yeah, these electrons go down here, these come back up into the oxygen, and we lose TMSO minus, and the result is the formation of a double bond in this position. Uh, and the reaction proceeds in 70% yield, which is fairly decent. Uh, and this product here is a ketene thioacetal. This turns out to be similar to earlier chemistry that was being done by E.J. Corey and co-workers in 1967, and they were using Wittig-type reactivity to affect the same kind of transformations. So their starting material was this cyclic trithiocarbonate, uh, which apparently is readily available, and one way you can make it is from the alkylation of the sodium trithiocarbonate salt with dibromopropane. Uh, they reacted it with two equivalents of trimethyl phosphite. The first equivalent reacts into the sulfur like this. This is phosphorus acting essentially as a thiophile, and you'll get the stabilized anion next to the sulfurs here. Uh, and then this bond can go up into the sulfur, and you get a byproduct with this phosphorus sulfur double bond, and you're left with a carbene here. So we can draw that either as just a lone pair, or you can draw it, if you like, as the charge separated form with a plus minus. I'm just going to leave it as the uh, lone pair here. And then this carbene reacts with a second equivalent of the trimethyl phosphite in a reaction like this. Uh, and we get an unstable uh, illid product. And I think this is one reason that perhaps was holding this chemistry back was this intermediate here was uh, couldn't be separated from the byproducts and it did eventually rearrange. So it had to be made and then used uh, in situ. And you can draw these illids uh, as the double bonded form like this, or you can draw them in the charge separated form here. Anyway, these react essentially like uh, Wittig reagents, and so the negative charge can add into a carbonyl here. We, electrons go up onto the oxygen, and then we get a uh, collapse of the intermediate, like on the previous slide, um, to give us the double bond in the product. So, really, a Wittig type reactivity here. I also found in the literature a much more modern and nicer version of this chemistry, so Manvar and co-workers almost 50 years later um, have found a better way to do this. Um, so they start with this cyclic 1,3-dithiane, and they react it with two equivalents of butyl lithium and two equivalents of chlorotrimethylsilane. And so what happens initially is you get the, the first deprotonation to give this um, organolithium species uh, with an extra equivalent of butyl lithium just hanging around in the reaction. Uh, then when the trimethyl chlorosilane is added in the quenching step, you get the first silylation, and then the next equivalent of butyl lithium does a second deprotonation, which is very fast. Um, and they were actually surprised that this could be done all in one pot. So the residual butyl lithium and trimethyl chlorosilane then react again um, to give this uh, bis 
silylated product. And this is quite an, an interesting carbon atom here with these four hetero atoms joined to it. And anyway, uh, they found that rather than needing butyl lithium now to activate the reagent, uh, they can do it simply by having something take off one of the trimethyl silyl groups. And so uh, using trimethyl silanoate, uh, which was used as the potassium salt, and then in the presence of tributyl ammonium cation, um, this can activate the reagent by this oxygen coming in, picking off one of the TMS groups. So rather than using a strong base, you've used a nucleophile again to generate the stabilized anion here. And then in the same kind of reactivity as we saw in Funk's 1988 route, um, the anion can add into uh, carbonyls. Uh, you get decomposition of the intermediate and formation of the double bond. So a couple of different ways you can affect this transformation. And you can see uh, these reagents essentially are elongating uh, an aldehyde to an acid, which is one carbon longer. So an interesting homologation. Um, this uh, ketene thioacetal serves as a, a masked carboxylate. You can see this carbon is at the acid oxidation level. So returning to the clovine synthesis, the next step is the decomposition of the ketene thioacetal to reveal the carboxylate here. And Funk and co-workers used uh, mercury salts to accomplish this reaction, and this is a pretty common way to decompose thioketals. They were following a procedure from Chamberlain in uh, 1985. And then the next step was to convert the carboxylate into a ketene for a very interesting reaction. And normally you'd think of doing that by converting the acid to the acid chloride and then doing elimination with triethylamine. Uh, however, in Funk and co-workers' hands, they found that that was an inconsistent um, reaction for them. Uh, and the reagent of choice was this 2-iodopyridinium salt. And, you can imagine that's fairly electrophilic, so the carboxylate adds in at this position and gives a activated uh, carboxylate. And then this proton can be lost. We do the elimination, and this pyridone serves as the leaving group to generate the ketene product. And I'll redraw that in a slightly different way to show the next reaction and turn it round so this methyl group is now at the back. Anyway, this ketene uh, is now very nicely set up for an intramolecular 2 plus 2 cycloaddition with the allyl group that we installed in the first step. So get a cycloaddition here and we form a, a cyclobutanone ring uh, in not unreasonable yield given the uh, complexity uh, that we've introduced into the scaffold. And now we've got all three rings that we need for the clovine synthesis. Yeah, but of course this cyclobutanone is a four-membered ring and we need a five-membered ring in clovine, the product. And this is where the next very interesting reaction comes in. And so they used trismethylthiomethyllithium, which is prepared in situ by the deprotonation of this species with butyl lithium. Uh, and this adds in to carbonyls like you'd expect any organolithium to do so. And we get an intermediate product like this with these three sulfur groups. Now, the interesting thing about this group here uh, is one of these sulfurs can leave uh, as part of a ring expansion and migration uh, reaction. So the oxygen's electrons from up here push down and we have a, a ring expansion and migration taking place and as usual the more substituted carbon migrates and the most substituted carbon here is this quaternary one at the back so this bond comes down here and one of these SME groups leaves and we've now had a very interesting ring expansion in 66% yield um, to convert this four-membered ring uh, into a five-membered ring. And normally uh, you need to activate one of these sulfurs to get it to leave by using a Lewis acidic metal like copper or mercury, uh, but Funk and co-workers found that this reaction was spontaneous and it just happened with no additional reagents. Um, I'm sure this is something to do with the fact that there's quite a significant relief of ring strain from going from a four-membered ring to a five-membered ring. And you can see this uh, is actually a really neat uh, product uh, because we have a masked 1,2-dicarbonyl. Um, so you could imagine all sorts of things you could do by exploiting the uh, differential reactivity here. You've got a, you know, a carbonyl here and a latent carbonyl here. Uh, what this group also does, though, uh, is it blocks one of the alpha positions 
of this carbonyl for enylization, and that's important in the next step because we need to introduce these two methyl groups. And so treatment of this intermediate with sodium hydride and methyl iodide gives us the dialkylation at this alpha position. Um, so not only is the sulfur reagent used as a ring expansion, it also blocks the reactivity and, and directs the methyl groups um, where they're needed. So this is a really elegant use of this reagent that, and also sets up the reactivity in a later step. Um, anyway, once the methyl groups are installed, uh, another thing that makes um, thioketals interesting is you can deprotect them uh, under different conditions to uh, normal ketals. And in particular, uh, they can be reduced completely to the methylene group. And so by using rainy nickel, um, these sulfurs can be torn off and replaced with hydrogens. And this gives us um, pretty much everything we need for the clovine scaffold, the final step just being changing this carbonyl out for the double bond. And the final step was done using the well-known Shapiro reaction, so condensation of tosyl hydrazine with the carbonyl affords this tosyl hydrazone here. And then the tosyl hydrazone is treated with two equivalents of butyl lithium. Now the first equivalent obviously takes off this acidic proton from the nitrogen. Uh, and then the second deprotonation happens here. These electrons go into there and we lose Ts minus off the nitrogen. And we're left now with a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond and an anion here. And that can push back down. And you can see now we've lost dinitrogen uh, as a very good, very stable leaving group. So that's just you know, gas that is removed from the reaction. And these electrons go here and give us this uh, vinylic anion, or more realistically in the reaction part, a, a vinyl lithium species. Um, and anyway, on the workup, this reacts with a proton in the quench. And in 55% yield for the final step, this completes the synthesis of clovine. So in conclusion, I think this is a really neat route. It's got some interesting reactions and reagents, uh, use of a very powerful intramolecular ketene cycloaddition to form this ring here, uh, and really elegant use of trismethyl thiomethyl lithium for the ring expansion that also sets up the correct reactivity to direct these methylations. I've put the links to the literature in the video description if you want to get more detail about any of these steps.